projects to date. He's a faculty member of Liverpool University and the Professor of Physics leading the Liverpool Accelerator Physics Group. Um, we'd also like to thank IOP Wales and the Department of Maths and Physical Sciences at Chester for supporting the event. And yeah, finally we'll hand over to Professor Welsh. It's been a great pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Georgia, for the kind introduction and for the invitation. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and have that opportunity to talk about my passion, really, um, particle accelerators and the many applications that they find both in fundamental research, but also in applications that benefit society. Um, as Theo told me um, beforehand, the, the seminar series is also used uh, to provide um, informal careers advice so maybe it is useful to just say a few words about um, where i'm coming from originally uh, so i did study physics and, and economics um, not in liverpool as you may have guessed from my accent uh, but at the university of frankfurt and uc berkeley in california um, i did my phd um, at uh, frankfurt university in uh, collaboration with gsi a large research facility in germany and, um, and Heidelberg University, where I then spent a few years as postdoc. I went for CERN for, uh, to CERN for, for three years after having spent three months in Japan um, as a fellow. And at CERN, I developed beam instrumentation and, uh, for various accelerators on, on the CERN site. And that's really where I got hooked into the whole idea of developing cutting edge monitors for all sorts of accelerators from the very low end uh, in energy all the way to top energies in the LHC and beyond. Um, I then, uh, after CERN, founded my own university uh, research group at the University of Heidelberg. So that's where the Quasar group originated. And after a year, I then got an offer for, um, for a lectureship or a readership at that time at the University of Liverpool. Um, in 2011, I became a, a professor in Liverpool, and since 2016, I have been head of department, and I have a term which now goes all the way to 2026. So that's in a nutshell is where I'm coming from, and if you have any questions around career choices um, or different areas of physics, by all means, please do fire those at me. Um, in general, during the seminar, I think the more we can have of a dialogue, the better. The easiest way um, to send me questions is to use the chat function um, within Teams, so you can just pop in um, any comments you have, and then either I will pick those up um, during the talk, or I'll uh, come back to them uh, later when we can also have a conversation, and you are by all means then also uh, free to turn on your cameras, um, and we can have a chat together. So that's the idea. Um, but let's um, start and, and look into particle accelerators. Um, so I, I guess one of the reasons why many of us ended up studying physics in the first place um, is because we are interested in how nature ticks, how it functions, and uh, to understand how the world around us is moving. Now, understanding the world around us is not an easy question to answer because that picture has changed a lot over time. 2000 years ago, people believed that the Earth was a disk, and in fact, some still do, until they looked into the sky and they found that, um, uh, that we are actually part of something bigger. And initially, they thought the sun would orbit around the Earth until they looked closer and they found that, in fact, the sun is fixed and the planets are moving around the sun. And that was until 100 years ago, the understanding, until again, people looked further and they found that the solar system is just a tiny bit of the universe. And today, what we know is that out of everything that's out there, we only understand 5%. So 95% of the universe is an unknown to us. And to look into the big questions, we have to go back into the very small and we have to understand what matter is made of. And that's exactly where particle accelerators come in, because they allow us to use them as microscope to look into the tiny building blocks of matter and to really see um, how nature functions and understand uh, physics laws in the very core. Now, how do we do that? Well, for that, um, I'm going to take you on a journey. And since we are all <laughs> connected via Zoom, it's, it's going to be a virtual journey. Um, I'm going to take you to CERN, the place where I spent uh, several years of my life. Uh, for those of you who haven't been there, um, CERN is um, uh, close to um, Geneva uh, in Switzerland. And you can see it on this illustration here. 
On the right hand side, you can see that blue spot, which is Lake Geneva. You can also see Geneva Airport here um, with the two runways. And then that large circle here, that's the Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest particle accelerator. And you can see it just about fits in between the Jura Mountains, which are here on the left hand side, and Lake Geneva. So it's pretty much the largest possible accelerator that could physically fit into that area because of the different uh, geological constraints. Uh, the whole accelerator is built 100 meter underneath ground, and that's because um, uh, physicists needed um, part of the soil that is stable enough to guarantee that the accelerator is not moving up and down, left and right during operation, and, and this, the solid stone could only be found in a depth of 100 meter. What you see also in the illustration is the big experiments at CERN. Um, there are four very large particle physics experiments. CMS, the compact muon solenoid, which after all isn't that compact. Uh, ATLAS, which is the largest of all the particle detectors. And I'll come back to ATLAS in just a few minutes. And then the two slightly smaller experiments, ALICE for heavy ion collisions and LHCB for forward physics, so a specific area of high energy physics. Now, the LHC, as I said, is uh, the largest accelerator in the world and, and probably the most prominent, uh, the, the king of accelerators, if you like. Um, it accelerates protons all the way to seven tera electron volts. Now, accelerator physics isn't a university um, standard module. And in Liverpool, we only started that when, when I joined the university a bit more than 10 years ago. And um, it's a final year module in, in, in Liverpool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you uh, Accelerator Physics 101 in, in just a minute or so and take you on a journey um, through an accelerator. Uh, so any accelerator has to start with a particle source, and that could be lots of different things. It could be electrons, it could be heavy ions, it could be protons. And in the case of the Large Hadron Collider, usually it's protons. So what we start with is a bottle of hydrogen gas. Um, which we ionize to create protons. We fire those into a linear accelerator, which takes these protons to a higher energy. And then we fire them into the first uh, circular accelerator. The accelerators work a little bit like the gear shift in your car. And for a specific energy range, a particular type is OK. But then you have to change a gear upwards and you have to go to the next acceleration stage. So already the proton synchrotron takes the protons to pretty much the speed of light. Uh, but then there is the super proton synchrotron, which is a stage where uh, they then are propelled to even higher and higher energies. And the SPS, the super proton synchrotron, already has a circumference of more than a kilometer. And what you see here, the Large Hadron Collider, that's the largest of all the rings. Um, and it then takes those protons, it takes them to a maximum energy of seven tera electron volts. And at the very end of that whole story, which involves all of these different machines, the particle beams, they are clashed inside of these giant uh, detector caves. And um, then that's where the magic happens, that's where we have the particle collisions. And that's then also where the work starts, because what you can see here from that animation is that there are many different traces that we have to analyze um, and understand. And most of them, we will know pretty much what they are. Uh, and that's actually not the interesting bit. I guess it's good that we know what they are. But what we are looking for are signatures that we have not seen before, because that's an indication of new physics. And one of these signatures, as you will all know, um, was most recently the Higgs boson that led to the Nobel um, Prize in 2012 uh, by Peter Higgs and co-workers. And that's one of these big discoveries. It's, it's, um, it's a reaction that was predicted some 40, 50 years ago. Um, and then it took the world so long to build a machine that could ultimately test that theory. Uh, a fantastic victory of science um, in terms of understanding nature better than before. And the experiments in the end really provided the evidence that that theory would hold. Now, ATLAS, um, as you can see here, um, is the largest of these detectors. And that's a photograph that was taken in the very early days. Uh, the detector is basically empty here. Um, lots of the, uh, or all of the interesting parts are missing. Uh, the tracking detectors that are in the center and also surrounding the center, they are all missing. 
Uh, what you can see here is just um, the, the coils that will ultimately generate the magnetic fields that will bend charged particles. Um, and you get an idea of the size by looking at the tiny person in the center of the image. And that's a standard scientist just for comparison. So you can see just how large Atlas is. The, um, the Atlas cavern um, is big enough that it could house the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, and to show the complexity of what that means for the experiments, uh, just a couple of numbers. When the two beams in the LHC collide, the cross section of the proton beams is of the order of 16 nanometers. So that's tiny. And you have to then see that the whole Atlas cavern is pretty much like a bubble of air in water. Um, well, it's a big bubble and it's not water, but it's soil, but still. Uh, it does the same thing as a bubble in water, it goes up and it goes up by roughly a millimeter per year. So what you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to shoot uh, with your very precise um, uh, 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 proton beam uh, pistol against another one. You're trying to hit the two beams with a cross section of only 16 nanometers whilst your whole um, apparatus is moving upwards, the whole cavern of the detector is moving upwards at a speed of a millimeter per year. Um, so quite a challenge and I guess that's just one illustration that shows you how important it is to know very precisely what's happening in the accelerator at all times and to have instruments that tell you what the beam is doing, how it is behaving, how it, is, how it looks like, um, because only then can you optimize the particle physics experiments. And um, I guess pushing instrumentation to the limits, so measuring particle beams better and with more precision than anybody was ever able to do that before, that has driven me and my group for many years now, and it remains a very, very interesting topic. Now, um, we, we uh, CEO and I, we, we spoke um, just before the seminar a little bit about um, uh, not only physics challenges, but also computing challenges. And the one thing that you will probably um, have guessed just, just based on the complexity of Atlas and the animation that you saw just earlier is that analyzing the data that comes out of Atlas is a huge task. Um, and it's in particular a task that involves enormous amounts of data. It's actually data that is so large that it cannot be analyzed and processed by a single facility. So it's again an example of where the world works together and where the computing resources have been pooled through the grid so that data analysis can take place all around the world 24 seven and where, the, where some of the most powerful computers are all there to make sense of the data and to find the new physics that's hidden somewhere. Now, in, in Liverpool, as in, in many other places, um, data science challenges um, are prominent in all areas of physics. Um, and I think just from the, the general media and the fact that now everybody has become a statistics experts through the various plots that are shown all the time um, uh, around the COVID pandemic, um, we, we have a, a, a special center for doctoral training on data intensive science. And, um, and that at the moment has 36 PhD students all working on data related projects. And on the right hand side, you can see these little icons and they represent the different um, clusters in our department and also at Liverpool John Moores University. And from top to bottom, this is condensed metaphysics, it's particle physics, accelerator science, nuclear physics and astrophysics. And that's a lot of modern physics and all have the same data challenges. And I think that's very clearly a message uh, for you guys and for your future. Um, as a physicist, um, one, of the, one of the big strengths that we have uh, compared to many other disciplines, especially economics, mathematics, is that a physicist is always used to work with numbers that have also a unit. And making sense of that data really is a, is a critical combination between these two quantities. Uh, you, you don't only have to look at the number of, say, if I take the COVID example, infected people, you need to look at this over time. So you need to bring in at least a second dimension. And uh, if you want to talk about impact on hospitals, you have to take many different aspects into account to really make sense of the raw data that is provided. Um, so dealing with data, handling data, processing and analyzing data 
that's an area which will no longer be a focus area of physics in the future. It will be an area of physics that's everywhere, no matter which direction you're going. Um, so in particle physics, that's, uh, I think, one of the originators of, of uh, high performance computing. It's really uh, particle physics that started off things like the Internet, like the grid, um, and really has pushed um, innovations that then also had huge impact on society at large. Uh, without the Internet, uh, what would we be today? Uh, if, if you uh, think of our mobile phones and the way that we are connected now, uh, take take the team session now. All of that would not exist without the Internet, with, with, which originally came through particle physics research. Now, from the very high energy end, um, I would like to take you to a different area of physics um, that is at the maybe extreme opposite in, in, in some aspects, and that's um, research involving antimatter. Now, a question I have for you guys is, um, how would you produce antimatter? What is the cooking recipe of creating antimatter in a lab? Any ideas? Okay, just speak up, up if you have any idea. Would it be more down to the actual like quarks that make up the particles that would make it an antiparticle? Yeah, so first we have to look into what are they actually composed of? What are the building blocks? And uh, okay, let's let's say we, we know how, what, uh, what we need. We know the ingredients um, that we need to produce uh, that we need for an antiparticle. How would we then build it? How would we how would we produce it in a say factory? Now there's there's one equation that um, if I ask any of my friends or neighbors who are not into physics, um, if there's any physics equation that everybody knows, it's 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 E equal M C squared. Um, so the the energy that you bring together in a specific area of space is equal to the mass of a particle multiplied by the velocity of light squared. Now, the interesting thing about this equation is that it doesn't say anything about what mass um, is created. Um, and that means the moment you bring energy at a specific region of space, uh, you create all sorts of particles. And it's then a question of cross sections and ultimately probabilities of with what likelihood are you going to produce a specific particle, including antiparticles? So a cooking recipe, um, if, if you like, would, would, would look like something like, like this one here. You take a high energy beam of protons and uh, coming from an accelerator uh, and you fire it in, onto a target. And that target is just a block of metal. It could be anything with a good heat conductivity, iron, iridium, anything like that. And then just because of that equation, um, you will, with a small fraction, also produce antimatter. That fraction is indeed very small. So every for every one million protons um, at the energy of CERN's accelerators, you create only one antiproton. So a yield of only 10 to the minus 6, which gives you an indication of how difficult it is to produce antimatter. Now, from that process, you see that you fire a high energy proton beam onto a target. You have that kind of explosion, E equals MC squared, and you create all sorts of different particles. So the next thing you have to do is you have to capture these particles, which will be high energy particles, and you have to then clean that mess. You have to filter out the particles that you really want, the antiparticles, and then you have to guide them onto a second accelerator because then you want to do something with them. Ultimately, you're not interested in having an antiparticle somewhere. You want to actually group them and you want to bring them into a specific area of space so that you can analyze them. Now, why would you want to analyze them? If we, if we believe that the universe was um, created through a Big Bang, then pretty much because of the equation that, that we've just discussed, 
uh, there should be equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the universe. And our current understanding, um, the standard model of particle physics, tells us exactly that. There should be equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Yet there's absolutely no antimatter in the universe. And the question is, why is that the case? Either there's something completely wrong with our current understanding of the universe, or there are small effects that at, at galactic dimensions become so large that they can explain why there is that asymmetry. Now, if we want to look into the latter, so if we want to see, are there any differences between a matter particle and its antimatter counterpart, we have to look into great detail into their properties. Now, what are these fundamental properties? If I take um, a simple um, particle, and the most simple particle um, would be um, antihydrogen, because that's just two protons combined um, with electrons in the normal case for hydrogen, and in the antiproton case, it would be two antiprotons combined with two positrons. And that's the most a basic element that we can imagine. And the hydrogen atom was studied with great detail. We know everything about the energy levels in the, in the hydrogen atom. And if we had antihydrogen confined in a specific region of space, we could make the same kind of experiments. We could make 1S, 2S laser spectroscopy. We could look at different um, hyperfine splittings. We, we can look in, into all different kinds of things and we can see, is it really a perfect mirror particle from the matter world or are there maybe any tiny differences? Now to do that, um, we need to, as I said, capture these particles and we, um, we need to do that in a device called a particle trap. Now, what's a particle trap? It's basically um, just an electric confinement field. Um, if I take a box of, say, that size, half a meter or so, and um, I fire a particle beam from one side onto an electric potential, so I need something which kind of kicks my particle beam back. And if I'm fast enough and I kick my particle beam back and then I switch on a second electrode, I will have my particle bounce back and forth between those two potentials. And then I've built a trap. So I need to inject my beam into the trap, have one potential already in place, reflect the antiparticle, turn on the second electric field, and thereby confine the antiprotons. I have to do all that reasonably quickly, um, but I guess, yeah, we know how to switch electric fields up to a certain uh, level in, in, and that level is maybe 50 or maximum 100 kilovolts um, quite quickly. Um, so that's kind of uh, what we need to do. So 100,000 volts in that trap for these mirror electrodes tells us that this is the energy to which we have to decelerate our antiprotons. So now we need to take the high energy antiprotons that we created, and these are GeV particles. We need to decelerate them in a decelerator. So that's basically an accelerator used in the wrong way to make the particles slower. Um, and we have to slow them down all the way to just 100,000 electron volt energy. And then we store them in a trap and then we can cool them. We can make them slower and slower all the way to rest. And once we have them at rest, we have that cloud of antiprotons. We can then merge that cloud with a cloud of positrons to create antihydrogen. And then we can do the measure measurements that I described before. So then we can really look into the details of antihydrogen and see how does that compare um, with hydrogen. And uh, so these experiments are incredibly difficult to do. And it took 20 years um, to do them at CERN at this machine that's shown on your screen, the antiproton decelerator facility, and most recently the new Elena ring, the extra low energy storage ring for antiprotons, uh, which decelerates the particles to exactly these 100,000 volts energy for direct injection into a particle trap. Now, um, this is how such a particle trap looks like. Um, you can see it's basically a, a lots of different electrodes. So what you see on the photograph are some white spaces. So these are insulators, which basically separate different areas with different voltages, and then copper-like structures, which have certain voltages applied to them. And between left and right, you have these two mirror electrodes. And in between those, we have our clouds of antiprotons in perfect vacuum, oscillate back and forth. 
And there are small openings so that we can inject a laser beam, for example. Um, and this is um, how these types of experiments are done. Um, and that's a particle trap that has been used very successfully um, at the AD facility. Now, in, in Liverpool, for the last few years, we have coordinated a, a European program um, called Accelerators Validating Antimatter Physics, or AVA, um, which is actually named after a girl that lived in Warrington, Ava Scott. Um, Ava uh, sadly passed away from cancer a few years ago, and in order to keep her, her memory, we named that project after her. So Ava, when you hear Ava, please do think of, of Ava Scott and also of the Antimatter project. Um, you can see a lot of physics uh, on that illustration here. What's shown here is actually the collision um, between an antiproton and a helium atom. And I, I leave you to work out the different traces in, in that illustrated graphics that looks like a spiral in the background. Uh, but a lot of research is going on in that field. And the challenges are detecting the antiparticles with high precision, developing instruments that do not interfere with the beam because we want to characterize the beam without touching it, developing new experiments that tell us everything about the antiparticles, and in particular, are there any differences compared to metaparticles? So lots of interesting things happening there. Now, um, with Georgia at the beginning, we talked about um, her interests in physics and, and I guess also um, the, the most challenging areas of, of uh, science and research at the moment. Um, and a very hot area for physicists is uh, medical applications. Now, um, beyond um, or in addition to the fundamental science research that I've talked about, particle accelerators also um, have a lot of um, applications that directly benefit society. Um, you all will, when you can um, and you travel internationally, um, have gone through airport security scanners. That is a small particle accelerator. Um, many of the of the food that we that we um, that we eat will will have been sterilized by using accelerators. Uh, there's even accelerators that are used to detect diamonds in rocks um, to make the search easier. And there are also accelerators that are used for medical applications. Um, so what I'm going to show you is a physicist representation of yourselves. Uh, this is you. Um, it may not immediately look like it, um, but um, on the x-axis you can see um, that it shows the penetration depths of a certain type of radiation in water. And that's basically what you are. 95% of your body is water. And uh, so if you look from left to right, you enter your body from the skin level and then you go uh, in, into your body 5, 10, 15, all the way 30 centimeters in your body. On the y-axis, you can see the dose or the energy that is that is deposited at a different at different depths inside of the body. So now imagine that you um, unfortunately develop a cancer somewhere inside your body. Could be your head. Uh, could be could be somewhere um, in in the corpus. Um, and and that's where you would have to to take out the cancer. You would have to to enter deep into the body of the patient to irradiate just the cancer cells. Now the question is, how do you best do that? And um, what's always a good idea for physicists is to not exclude any options, but to look at what is on the market. And I'm sure the one radiation that you all have some experience with is X-rays, um, either because you had a dental X-ray or because you had unfortunately a bike or skiing accident in the past and you had to go to a hospital. Uh, one of the fundamental properties of X-rays is they can shine all the way through your body. And that's what you see in this plot. Uh, if you look at it, uh, the yellow graphics goes all the way to 30 centimeters and it basically goes through your body and you get a projection of the image of what's inside of your body. You see a second effect and that is that most of the dose is actually delivered early on. So um, as you enter the body, um, a lot of the energy from the X-rays is at skin level or just a few centimeters depths. Now, if you take into account what I said earlier, um, this has advantages and disadvantages. If I develop a tumor that's maybe 20 centimeter, 20 centimeter deep in my body, the good news is I can reach it. I can bring energy to that tumor. And ultimately, if I can bring energy there, if, if I bring enough energy there, I can kill the tumor. So that's good. 
What's not so good is that I deposit a lot of energy also in parts of the body where there is healthy tissue and where I would not normally like to deposit that dose. So in principle, there's something that I can use, but there's also something which I don't like too much. So let's look at the second option um, and uh, a particle that's also used a lot in hospitals are electrons. Uh, with electrons, it's it's actually worse than with x-rays because here you can see that the maximum depth in the body is actually just 12 or 13 centimeters. So if I wanted to go to 20 centimeters, there's no way I can do it with electrons. There's no way that I can get deep enough to deposit any dose at the location of the tumor. At the same time, I have the same unwanted effect that I deposit a lot of energy early on, so at skin level or a few centimeters deep, and that's again not what I want. So electrons are really not great for deep-seated tumors. Now, a complete game changer happens when we move over to protons or heavy ions, and the red curve is identical for either 200 mega electron volts protons or 5 GeV carbon ions. And what you can see here is a phenomenon which is referred to as a Bragg peak. Um, and that is that ions can enter into the body of a patient basically unseen. There's very little interaction with the tissue early on. And then at some point, there is something like a chain reaction kicking in and essentially all of the energy is deposited at a very specific location in the body. Now, that location depends only on the energy of the particle beam. So by changing the energy of your beam, you can determine exactly where you deposit that energy. And when you know the shape of your tumor, whatever three-dimensional shape that is, you just need to make sure that you then scan that tumor from left to right and also longitudinal through the beam energy and you deposit the energy at the location of the tumor. You cook the tumor, you kill it, um, and you can do that without affecting the healthy tissue. So a complete game changer um, in terms of treatment of some cancers. And these are really well localized, deep seated tumors, um, which can be treated with proton and heavy ion beams better than with any other treatment modality. Now, I was going to talk about accelerators. Uh, so I have another uh, short film for you and you will see it's basically the same fil film as I've shown before. We start from a particle source, go through a linear accelerator, go into a ring accelerator, a synchrotron, very much like the one at CERN, and then we go through a beam delivery system into a gantry, which is the final part of a beam delivery system that takes the beam all the way to the patient. And that rotating um, infrastructure allows us to irradiate the patient from the angle um, and direction that we want to have the irradiation. So the medical experts, they can look into a treatment plan, they can determine how they how we would like to develop that uh, or deliver that radiation to the patient, and then we can do exactly that. The infrastructure is very large. So what you see here is a gantry for heavy ions, and that is a 700 ton instrument. And that has to move around the patient with a precision of better than a millimeter, because that's kind of the resolution that we are targeting. So again, you see that uh, why I'm so passionate about instrumentation and monitors. You need to monitor all of that at all times, because you want to know exactly what type of beam do you deliver where in the patient? And that's what makes it so interesting. And what you can see from the animation is the technology is exactly the same as for fundamental research. So it's a direct technology transfer. And uh, when, when Georgia and I talked about this beforehand, um, this is really an example where you can use the fundamental physics knowledge that you have now built up over the last few years, and you can directly use it in a hospital um, and you can help improve these techniques. Now, um, the last part um, that I want to, um, to cover is to um, have a little bit of a look into the crystal ball. Um, where are we going from where we are? Because that all sounds like um, I'm already um, showing you the complete picture and we have fantastic machines for high energy physics. We can do all these wonderful treatments. What could we do that makes these even better? Now, one of the biggest limitations of accelerators is the fact that the moment you work with radio frequency voltages, at some point you are limited by the maximum voltage that you can generate. You can um, understand that probably quite easily when you look at a simple parallel plate capacitor. 
if I take the two plates and I ramp up the voltage between them, at some point what's going to happen is there will be a spark and there will be an electric breakdown and the voltage that I, that I have generated no longer exists. The charges, they jump over and I've destroyed my electric field. When that happens, my acceleration stops, I can't go to higher energy. So there is this intrinsic limit um, that is defined by the maximum potential gradient or the maximum electric field that I can generate to accelerate a beam of charged particles. Now, you all know um, uh, an example of where much, much higher voltages can be generated. And, um, and that example is the sun. In the sun, there are voltage differences that are much higher than what we could possibly create uh, with radio frequency. And uh, the, the reason why that is the case is because the sun is in a different uh, physical state uh, referred to as plasma. And in a plasma, you don't have the same limitations in maximum voltage as you find it in radio frequency applications or in this parallel plate capacitor. So is there maybe a way of how we can um, use that, that effect, how we can use a plasma to accelerate particle beams better than we can do that with radio frequency technology? And this is an illustration here that shows you a flash of light, that's uh, the white bubble here, uh, that propagates through a plasma. The flash of light is a high intensity laser, and the plasma is just a mix of different ions and electrons. When the laser beam, the laser pulse, travels through that plasma, what you see is it creates a wake. Uh, a wake very similar to a boat that is uh, driving over a lake and that creates a wake behind it. And you can see the analogy is almost perfect. You have these little waves created behind the laser beam and a wave in that plasma corresponds to voltage differences. And these voltage differences, they are very large. They are a thousand times larger than anything that we could produce with um, radio frequency. So if we use a laser, to drive a plasma, we create these waves in the plasma, and then we inject a second particle beam at exactly the right time into these plasma waves. We can then use that very high potential to accelerate the injected beam. And that's what re what's referred to as laser plasma accelerators. Now, you can, you can drive the plasma with a laser, you can drive it with an electron beam, you can also drive it with a proton beam. There's very different ways of how that can be done. Um, and all of this is very exciting. It's very much forward looking science and it's all happening right now. Some of this is actually happening at Darsbury where, where we are driving a plasma um, with an electron beam. Now, um, what can you do with that? Um, if you're looking into the future, what you need to do is um, you need to look into your targets. Where do you ultimately want to go? And well, I guess one of the important things for you guys is when you are now doing your projects, um, you need to make sure that you have smart targets. That's typically what project managers are referring to. And, uh, and SMART targets is an acronym uh, which is used in project management language. You can tell that I've studied economics there. Um, and it stands for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and timely. Um, so you need to be quite specific about what, to, what you want to achieve, how you want to achieve it, uh, with what kind of means you are going to achieve it, why you need it, and also the time scale um, over which you want to achieve that. The time scale in the case of your project is very clearly defined by the submission deadline, um, I'm afraid. Now, um, to me, the, the most famous um, uh, smart target of all times is the moon landing and what JFK said uh, about uh, getting um, man, uh, human, humankind to the moon. And what he said was that this nation should commit itself to achieve the goal before this de uh, decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning them safely to Earth. So that's a very clear time frame by the end of the 60s, and it happened in 1969. Uh, we take a human to the moon, and very importantly, the goal is also to bring them back. So not just shoot them there, uh, but also bring them back. So that's a smart goal. Um, in the accelerator field, there's an ana analogy um, that was defined by these three gentlemen here, all three of them being Nobel laureates. In the middle, that's Rutherford, and then you have um, Cockcroft and Walton that all got uh, Nobel Prizes in physics. 
what they said at the time, uh, Rutherford uh, in Manchester said he needs an apparatus to give us a potential of the order of 10 million volts, which can be safely accommodated in a reasonably sized room and operated by a few kilowatts of power. And we also need an exhausted tube that's capable of withstanding this voltage. And I see no reason why this cannot be made practical. And this was built afterwards, this machine, this accelerator, and that's what led to the uh, splitting of the nitrogen atom, and that's what gave him the Nobel Prize, so a very famous smart goal in physics. Now, back to plasma accelerators. Um, I think there we also have um, a smart goal, and it also involves the next decade. Um, Eupraxia is um, a pan-European or now global initiative that um, is looking at building the next generation plasma accelerator with industry applications. And there what we say is we require the design and construction of a laser capable of delivering pulses with a duration of 100 femtoseconds and an energy of 100 joule at a repetition rate up to 100 hertz. So that's the 10 to the power of three challenge and a user facility built around this technology in the next uh, decade. And amongst other things, I am trying to bring part of that facility to Darsbury because I think that would be a fantastic addition to the research infrastructures that we have already in this country. Um, so that's um, one of the, the aims in the future. I guess another aim is, and, I, and, and Georgia mentioned that very briefly in her introduction, is how can we make things even smaller? And with small, I really mean very, very small. Um, for those of you who know the, the film Inner Space, where they built the robot that was injected into the human body, uh, why not dream of a particle accelerator that could fit into the palm of your hand or even the tip of your finger? And we are doing that. Um, and you can see here a prototype of uh, accelerator that we have developed with colleagues in Stanford and the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland. It's a very compact uh, dielectric structure um, powered by a laser and used to accelerate electron beams. Um, and that fits onto the tip of your finger. Um, and that's again using gradients a thousand times higher than what we can currently achieve. So really um, something which is next generation and that's happening in accelerator science at the moment. And it's not far from you. I mean, the uh, the Cockroft Institute is just down the road if you want. And we we, we had students from uh, from through TIO in the past um, that have very successfully done projects with us. Um, it's um, an international center of excellence for accelerator science. There's nothing quite like the Cockroft Institute anywhere in the world. Um, and uh, we are bringing together universities, the Darsbury National Lab infrastructure, and companies from the UK and abroad uh, to um, build and design better accelerators. So I guess that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Um, there's still so much to be done. And, uh, and I guess that's a message to you guys, because that's your future. That's your careers. Uh, we need great ideas. Uh, we need um, physicists with great ideas and passion. Uh, and I hope what I managed to do today is um, to show you that accelerators have many benefits for both science and society. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Karsten. That was uh, a wonderful, uh, very informative uh, talk. And I really like the fact that you managed to bring so many concepts and describe them in just uh, 45 minutes. Uh, Georgia, would you like to take over? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Carson. That was very informative, very insightful as well, actually. Um, if anybody has any questions, we would ask us to either put them in the chat so that they can be addressed or raise your hand just to stop everybody speaking over each other. And then Elliot has a question. Yep. Hello, Carsten. Uh, it's a question about the Large Hadron Collider, which you had earlier, which you discussed, and you were saying that it was moving upwards. Why is that? Is that just because of the energies of the colliding particles? Is it just more geological? No, it's geological. It's really uh, it's like a, it's like a bubble in of air and water because the cavern is 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 basically also air. Um, it, it moves upwards and that can be measured. Um, it's, it's just one example of what needs to be measured. Uh, you may have seen 
um, papers about the impact of high speed trains that are entering the town of Geneva. You can see the movement of these trains um, on the diagnostics for the particle beam. So when the train arrives or departs, you can see how the beam is moving. And then, of course, your control system needs to compensate all these movements. I think what I wanted to, to do with these numbers is just to show um, how tiny the details are that have to be measured online all the time to be able to control these beams and to know everything about them. Awesome, thank you for that. That's actually quite, quite interesting. Thank you. Um, I have one actually. Uh, sure. how, lar how large do you think the scope is um, for accelerator improvement to benefit the public in like the next 10 to 25 years? I that's that's an interesting question. I, I think there's uh, there's many uh, opportunities for applications that have direct society benefits. So one of the things, for example, that I couldn't show, but that we are developing um, is we are developing a, a fully portable X-ray device uh, for three for. I mean, you need to listen to that carefully for three dimensional X-ray imaging at lower dose, lower cost and a form factor that allows it to be transported to wherever you need it. So think of the bike accident that I mentioned earlier. At the moment, you have to go to a hospital and then the doctors, they take your X-ray with a certain resolution and they expose you to a certain dose. Uh, that means the, the X-ray imager is, uh, has a certain size and cost, so um, it, it will not be available at every GP practice and, and maybe not even at every hospital if you're looking at CT scanners, for example. Now, what we want to develop is a, a fully portable X-ray diagnostics, the size of a laptop, which gives you 3D images at lower dose and lower cost, so that basically every GP can have it. You can use it. Um, but the ambulance could use it. That's coming. Uh, you could you you could have it in in veterinary um, pra practices, um, so that also um, the animals would benefit from these techniques. So that's a, a huge element of of where accelerators could impact massively on what we are doing at the moment. In terms of science, um, no matter where you're looking, whether it's dark energy, dark matter, um, uh, supersymmetry, new particles. I mean, anything or a lot of areas at the moment that are trying to push the boundaries, they have accelerators um, involved one way or the other. If you look at um, strategic roadmaps um, in science, um, one of the, the, the very popular ones is the European Strategic uh, Infrastructure Facilities Roadmap, ESRI. Um, and 50% of the infrastructures, so that these are future infrastructures, they rely on particle accelerators. Um, so it's, it is a technology which will be with us for, for many decades to come. And uh, the, the trend that I've tried to show in terms of making things smaller, more efficient, whether that's for medical applications, for the airport security scanners, um, all of this will, will come more and more in the future. Thank you. That was a great answer, actually. Hey, Ed. Hello. Um, so I don't know if you've heard about the high luminosity upgrade they're doing to the Large Hadron Collider. What yep. do you think that'll allow the discovery of? Do you think that'll like further advances into uh, more subatomic particles, more discoveries, or do you think it's more just to improve the efficiency? So the, the first thing I should say is, um, and I think, again, that's probably interesting for you guys because it's it's just happening down the road. So we are um, a, a key partner in the high luminosity upgrade and there are students and postdocs that are building now instruments for the high luminosity LHC. Why we are doing that? Because there is no instrument at the moment that could um, characterize the beam in high lumi LHC at the moment. There is nothing that could tell um, the operators how the beam is looking like. Why is that the case? And that's now coming to your question. So high lumi is going to squeeze down the particle beam to a smaller dimension to increase the luminosity by a factor of 10. Factor of 10 means a, a factor of 10 um, event rates at least. Um, and, and that just in terms of statistics means if now you have to wait 10 months of data collection um, to get a specific result, it then is only a month of time um, with the high luminosity LHC 
Um, there's also hope that we can access areas which at the moment are completely inaccessible. Um, so it's really entering a new territory, if, if you like, of particle physics. Awesome, thank you for that, that's a good answer. Hi, I actually have a question. Um, uh, Karsten, you mentioned before uh, about ion beam therapy, and uh, uh, it, it was obvious that carbon ion and uh, protons are most effective. I was wondering whether uh, neutrons were used for, for uh, beam therapy. I is it possible at all? I just thought that because since they don't have charge, maybe it's easier to penetrate even further. Yeah, neutrons are, are, are used and there, there are some advantages, you're, you're quite right, um, in, in that uh, you can irradiate the entire body, so the neutrons are basically go through the body, uh, and if you previously inject some material that makes it more likely to capture the neutrons, you could kill um, the, 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 the cancer even more effectively. Um, in fact, uh, one of the development projects at a facility called CNAO in Italy, at the moment is looking into combining carbon ion therapy with boron capture neutron therapy. So you, you inject boron into the body um, of the patient and then you irradiate with neutrons. And that really means you, you don't even have to position the patient. They just they, they are in the room and then you fire the neutrons everywhere. Uh, and only where you have the boron um, is, is where something happens. And that um, might be an even more efficient treatment modality in the future. Uh, so that's definitely being considered. Ah, wonderful. <laughs> hey, um, another one. Um, so, you know, you're talking about the trapping of particles in that um, when you were bouncing off the two plates. Does that not also depend on, for example, the lifetime of the particle? So it's a very short existing particle. Um, would that not mean that if you were to trap it, you only trap it for that certain period of time? Uh, correct. And uh, that in itself was uh, a, a very interesting physics experiment at the start because people weren't sure about the lifetime. And that's one of these properties. People weren't sure about the lifetime of the antiproton is because we don't we don't have any antimatter in the universe. It could have been that it's a particle that's just not stable. So they, nobody knew whether there is maybe a limitation in the lifetime of these particles. And that's why we don't see them. Now, the the vacuum pressure um, in these um, particle traps is so good that it's actually impossible to measure it. It's so good that there's nothing left to be measured. In, in fact, you can only um, derive the vacuum pressure by scaling the lifetime to pressures that you can still measure. And what was found is that there is no limitation. There have been anti single antiprotons stored in particle traps for more than a year until they were annihilated by the operator because they just wanted to get rid of them. They gave them names. They uh, they, they had individual particles in the traps um, and, and they, they looked into that. And because the lifetime is so good, because the vacuum pressure is so phenomenally good, so we're talking better than 10 to the minus 15, minus 16 millibars, uh, there is now an experiment which is only just starting called base step and that will build a trap that captures the antiprotons at CERN and then takes them to a pre precision laboratory in Germany. And the reason is uh, that some of the effects that I mentioned before, the trains around Geneva, the, the very high fields that are uh, caused by, by some of the installations, uh, don't make CERN an ideal place for precision studies. And that's why people now want to take these antiprotons take them to a lab which is um, in, 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 in underneath the ground, perfectly shielded, and do some of the measurements there to see if they can look even more in detail into these. Very good question, Elliot. Awesome, thank you. That's, that's got like different applications to um, any particle you can imagine you want to investigate. So you could trap, like, say you discover a new particle that exists for less than 10 to the 15 yes. seconds and you can trap it. It means you can extend that lifetime twofold for as long as you want. Okay, yeah. awesome. Thank you. So can I just ask a follow up question? How, how stable is the anti hydrogens actually? I was wondering. There's also I don't think there is any limit that was discovered so far. There's, there's no lifetime limit um, to it. So it's it's really down to annihilation. So the moment it touches anything, it will annihilate into a flash of light and there's nothing left over. Uh, but in a trap, uh, in a in a perfectly shielded environment, 
there's nothing that was discovered so far. In fact, there's there's no difference that was uh, found so far, not in the laser spectroscopy measurements, not in gravitational measurements. So people are looking into all different kind of properties of the antiparticles, but so far nothing was found. So that means still fundamentally, we don't know what's going on. We don't know why there is this asymmetry. And what I said at the beginning, I mean, this is your homework after the seminar today. We don't understand 95% of our universe. And that means there's so much more that we have to do. Mm. So basically you mean that uh, if you look into the anti-hydrogen, you can solve it, uh, you can extract the, the energy levels through Schrodinger's equation basically. Yeah. And and still um, th there are things missing experimentally. Yeah. Yeah, you would. I mean, the hope would be that experimentally you could show that there are some differences because I mean, what we what we see is we see there is no antimatter. So where, where has it gone? There must be a reason why it's not here. And one of the explanation could be some corrective factor in one of the most fundamental equations. It could be coupled to gravity understanding, it could be coupled to any of the forces that we know, uh, and it could also um, uh, have an effect on Schrodinger's equation at some point. So we know very, very precisely from theory and from measurements how the hydrogen atom behaves. And what we, I think what we would like to, is to see is that there is a difference, but so far nobody discovered any difference experimentally. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Carson. Thomas. This may be a stupid question, kind of hesitant to ask it, but using the particle accelerator, using the magnetic fields to, I, we know how the particle, say like if it came down to an electron, it changes in the magnetic field to point in the direction of the magnetic field. If you were um, to, is it possible to change um, the spin of a particle using a magnetic field? So the, the spin is, for some experiments, the spin is very important. There's actually, there are specific, uh, so the, there are elements in a particle accelerator that bend the beam, that focus the beam, and these elements, they, they will or will not affect uh, also the spin of the particles inside the beam. And for some experiments, uh, for example, the ones that are done at a, a facility at Jülich um, in Germany, um, it is very important that the spin is conserved. And then there's a specific type of um, iron uh, beam ele uh, element called Siberian snakes. Um, and it's, it is a device which was invented to maintain the spin orientation so that you don't have spin mixing. If you don't use that, you would end up at some point uh, with, with a mix of different states and you couldn't do your experiments in the way that you want. So it's actually important that once you know what kind of experiment you would like to do, that you then carry out these beam tracking studies using high performance computing um, approaches and then ask yourself, what do I actually need to know? Do I need to know how a charged particle is moving or am I also interested in how the spin behaves with that particle? And depending on your question, you will have a, a more a higher or lower multidimensional parameter space and that space you then need to track through your accelerator. So the more questions you ask, the more boundary conditions you have, whether you consider only the movement, the velocity, or also the spin, it then means that you have to make more complex um, assumptions and more complex computations. But it is something that, that you can control in an accelerator, and it is something that will be affected by the magnetic fields. Okay, because um, the reason why I started thinking this question was, there's a long time, I think it was around about a few, a few months ago, um, scientists in a laboratory um, almost got, um, was it, cadmium or something to almost absolute zero. Change the um, spin of the particles within the cadmium using a laser. And it had a, a very unique physical characteristic where it appeared to have a negative mass, which is still undergoing. And I was wondering if that changes the characteristic. If you're able to change the spin with the particle and the particle accelerator and you collide it and you went to collide these particles, would we end up with a different result rather than the standard like collisions yeah i i see i see the question it's, it's, a, it's a very good one and good to see that you made the the transfer between those experiments i think the a challenge will be that 
we are talking about very different energy regimes. So in an accelerator, when we are doing these spin studies, we are typically at relativistic speeds and we are conserving the spin. Whereas the, the experiment that you described is basically at, at zero Kelvin absolute rest. So uh, in a magnetic magneto optical trap, you have lasers from all sides. Um, and, 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 and that's just fundamentally a very different experiment. So the, there isn't a direct relationship between the way that we control spin motion in a high energy accelerator and the motion or the behavior of the spin in such a trap, unfortunately. OK, thank you. If you have any questions related to careers development or anything else, um, I think we've probably come to the end of the seminar. So sorry it took it took so long, but I, I really enjoy the question. So feel free to to ask me a couple more. Yeah, I was about to say actually. So maybe Carsten, just to uh, make a, a quick, a brief introduction in terms of careers, how could one, a student, an undergraduate student, get into um, uh, working uh, at CERN or at Corford uh, Institute? Uh, what would be the first steps, you think, for an undergraduate student? So I, I think an, an internship like some of your fellow students have done it in the past um, could be a project. It could be an internship um, in the summer. Uh, we have continued to offer internships, virtual in internships in some cases, even through the pandemic. Um, I think that's a very, a very good step um, in, into that direction. In terms of your, your own career planning, um, I mean, research is very international in pretty much any area of modern research. The world collaborates and I think it's important to gain um, international experiences. So you heard from my brief introduction, I spent some time in the US, in Japan, in Switzerland, and you, you find that in many academic and, and researcher careers. And the reason is not only because we like traveling and we want to go to uh, exotic places. It's really about understanding how different um, parts of the world tick, how different mentalities are functioning, also to get exposure to different laboratory environments and the way that people collaborate. So I think getting these kind of experiences internationally, but also in different sectors, so looking into the university environment and also into and having an understanding of how things are done differently in industry or at a research center like a national lab. I think all of this is, is, is quite important. So to get to get into that kind of um, uh, process, um, applying for any of the programs that are on offer. CERN has a fantastic summer student program, which is um, available for year two and year three uh, undergraduate students. So that's exactly uh, the perfect timing for you guys. Um, there's also a summer student program at Darsbury where, where this year there will be 500 students accepted and 50 of them will get um, a very um, intimate um, training involving also project work on campus. Um, and, and many of the labs have that kind of uh, opportunity. So it's really about uh, first asking yourself uh, what kind of physics are you interested in and then establishing the link to those leading laboratories, which all are offering similar schemes. Thank you, Carsten. Thomas. In terms of CERN, yeah. um, they do competitions. I know it stem, as far as I'm aware, it stem back in 2016 to present day. Every year they do a competition where like students are able to submit a possible experiment which they can carry out. And if they get accepted, they get to carry out their own experiment within CERN. Yes. Is that a really good gateway to getting a job at CERN or? Well, getting getting a job at CERN is hard um, because the way that this works at CERN is you, I mean, many people start at CERN by doing a project, a summer project, and then maybe they decide to do a PhD at CERN which takes three years typically, and then they might stay a little bit longer, which would typically be a CERN fellowship. After the fellowship, uh, you would then apply for a staff position at CERN, and that will be a fixed term contract for four years, five years maybe. So you, you can tell already now I've, I've covered easily 10 years plus um, of time spent at CERN without still having no certainty that you can stay there. Uh, the permanent positions at CERN are quite strongly restricted to people who are working 
on the infrastructure. There are very, very uh, few places for, for example, particle physicists or computational experts. I think the philosophy is very, is very much about bringing people in for a few years, boosting them in terms of their science and often also in terms of their careers, rather than keeping them for life. Um, so getting getting a job at CERN in this sense is, is really difficult. Uh, the competition is very high and it does also require all these previous steps. So without having done either a PhD there or a fellowship, getting a staff post, uh, a fixed term staff post is incredibly hard to very unlikely. Um, but even then you would have to spend four or five years and then you have to uh, be one of the lucky ones and the ratio is between 25 and 33% only of the ones that are then converted into a permanent role. Uh, for most people that will not be compatible with their family lives and, and, and other plans, uh, but spending some time at CERN, starting from an internship and then spending a few years there, to me the three years that I spent at CERN even though I didn't stay there, were some of the best time of my life. And uh, so I would always very strongly recommend that. Thank you for that. Jordan. Hi, um, I was just wondering, so at Darsbury Labs, um, what type of, what current projects are you researching? And like, I've seen that there's plans to be upgrading the accelerator there. What type of upgrades are you looking at implementing? So Darsbury Lab in general is, is large. There's lots of different activities going on. So I think no matter what your interests are, whether they are in computational physics, in material science, in environment science, or in accelerator physics, uh, there's lots of things going on. Uh, what you mentioned specifically um, about upgrade programs, so Darsbury has a history of being an electron beam facility. Uh, there was a light source in the past, a synchrotron, um, and there is an electron accelerator at the moment. And what Darsbury wants to develop is the next generation of very high quality light sources called free electron lasers, especially in X-ray free electron lasers. And, and for that, they want to uh, develop a prototype facility on site um, that will also then be used as a test bed for electron driven plasma acceleration. So the future is using electrons, that's sure, um, and then going into three different strands, industry applications, high quality light sources and plasma acceleration. OK, thank you. Just a quick follow up question. Um, at like the companies that you like, is it Aztec and a few of the other companies with the graduate schemes? And um, what what's the training like there? Is it good? At, um, they, they train you quite a lot with the graduate schemes. Yeah, and it's it's training on the job, so it's it's hand on hands on training. You 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 will get your hands dirty. Uh, you get fantastic training um, on on site. The infrastructure is is world class. I mean, that's it's really very high quality, and uh, and Darsbury graduates will find it easy easy to find jobs in the region in the UK and also internationally. So I I, I strongly recommend that program. And, and not limited to accelerators at all. It's really, I, I, I think, very highly of the quality of the training provided on campus. Yeah. Um, I was looking, there's a vacuum engineer role that I was interested in. I was just wondering what type, do you know what that role is and what that would be involved with? What type of like training and research is? Not, not in great detail, but we are we are working closely with the vacuum group and, and, and I guess there um, what you have in particular in recent years is when you want to create very high quality vacuum is you're, you're looking into coatings, thin film coatings of um, materials to create ever and ever better vacuum vacua that can be more easily maintained. Uh, that has also applications outside of fundamental research. I think especially now again with, with COVID, um, people are looking into antibacterial surfaces and these require treatments under vacuum typically where you apply some coating that would then kill viruses, for example, over extended periods of times. Um, so it's it's a group that's, that's very much cutting edge uh, in what they are doing. Um, if you want to find out, I would suggest to just um, drop them an email um, to either Joe Herbert or anybody else from the team and, uh, and ask them. I mean, they will give you an open and honest answer. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we are getting close to the end. Um, it's already 10 minutes past two. Um, <laughs> are there any very final questions? 
If not, uh, could you please all um, open your mics and give a round of applause to, uh, to our speaker, uh, Professor Wells. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Really thanks very much. It, it has been a pleasure. And, and Georgia, CEO, thanks, thanks so much for the invite. I, I really enjoyed it. If, if there are any questions, do drop me an email. I'll be quite happy to, to follow up. Otherwise, keep enjoying your studies. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Carsten. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.